going to, uh, we're in a series about God's unfinished book, which is the book of Acts. It is the story, the history of the early church, the founding of the church, which then continues and includes us today. And as we're looking back at what seems to be very ancient history, we're finding, in fact, that there are many contemporary lessons for us as we see how the Holy Spirit established the church in the beginning. Um, the disciples of Jesus, then or now, we should be the same. Jesus never changes. What God plans for us, what God has for us, what God expects of us, does not change through time. God doesn't lower his standards just because times are tougher and society is harder. God remains the same and his people remain the same because we are plugged into an unchanging God. Um, whose power also remains the same in our lives. And so I encourage you as we go through this series in Acts that you take to heart what you see and hear about these early disciples because God's plan is still the same and God's power available to you and me through the indwelling Holy Spirit is still the same. Amen? <coughs> Amen. <coughs> I'm still coughing, but... We're going to get we're going to get through it. I think I'm on the mend. <coughs> so we're going to finish up this part, um, the the end of the Paul's companions, and uh, just very quickly, you'll remember last week we started with uh, the start, the beginning of the second missionary journey, which began very inauspiciously. You know, with Chinese New Year coming up, uh, we want. Uh, society wants auspicious things, right? Auspicious beginnings, yes? Uh, we, we're, if, especially if we're um, part of a Chinese household, we're cleaning our houses. Um, anything, any broken furniture, it's out, right? You don't, you don't want it there. Um, if your car's dirty, as I've seen in my village, oh, people are washing their cars. I drove up and I looked at my, my neighbor, he was out washing the car and I said, oh, washing for Chinese New Year, I've learned. And he goes, yes. And I said, oh, my car's dirty. And he looked over, he says, it really is. <laughs> I felt judged, <laughs> so I'm afraid I'm going to have an inauspicious beginning to Chinese New Year, but um, <coughs> as we look at this second missionary journey, it seems to have begun very inauspiciously, right? Uh, it begins with a sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas, these two giants of the early church, both called of God, both godly men, both spirit-filled, and that encourages me because sometimes we get in such a pickle ourselves, don't we? We too at times get into, into disagreements. Not that we should, but we are human and we see that God still works with us. I don't know about you, but sometimes I, when I get in situations like this, I kind of want to give up on people. I, I kind of want to say, well, forget you. I'm just going to go ahead. And God never does that, does he? God never, oh, so encouraging. God never gives up on us. He never says, this is too tough. This is too hard. He keeps on working wherever there's an opportunity. And so Paul and Barnabas split. They go in different directions. And there's no question um, that the enemy means it for bad. There's no question about that, but God brings good out of it. Now, <coughs> we must not let that be an excuse that when bad things happen for us to throw up our hands and say, oh, well, that's okay, God's doing something good. Um, what we see with Paul and Barnabas still is two men who are committed to God and to his ways, and because of that, God is able to bring something good out of it. And if you're in a tough situation now where it seems things cannot work out, commit yourself to the Lord and to His ways and let Him bring something good out of it. I think for both of them, as we see, uh, as we have seen already and as we will see more, I think both of them God worked on. I think God worked on Barnabas. I think God worked on Paul and John Mark and some of these others as they went on. And it's a reminder to us as we look at this, this inauspicious beginning, obviously Barnabas thought he was right, didn't he? Obviously Paul thought he was right, yeah? And the Bible does not tell us which one was right and which one was wrong. So maybe for you and for me, 
When we get in situations like this where we are in disagreement with brothers and sisters who love God also, it's probably good for us to take a step back a little bit and say, okay, God, I think I'm right. In fact, God, I'm sure I'm right. Have you ever told God that? I have sometimes. Oh, God, I know I'm right. I know they're wrong. Um, but given some time, uh, God is able to give each one of us perspective on things that we didn't have perspective on in the beginning. And he's able to work things out for good uh, in the situation and in us as well. I, I think if I were choosing a co-worker at that time, Barnabas would have been my choice, right? He's an encourager, he's gentle, he's whatever, and, and he, you know, he, he puts up with a lot because John Mark, as we know, deserted them and went back, but Barnabas was willing to give him another chance. Paul was not. I, I think Paul would have been hard to, to, to live with and to work with. I really do, um, <coughs> because, of his, because of his high calling and because of his standards. And yet God uses both of these types. So be encouraged uh, that each one of us, whatever our personality, Whatever our nature, whatever our character, God has a place for us in His kingdom. God has a work for us in His kingdom. Don't judge everybody else, their gifts and their failures, by your gifts and by your failures. And I think we tend to do that. We think, well, they're not like me, and so, well, they don't do this. But God has room for all of us in His kingdom. But where there are weaknesses and shortcomings, because God loves us, He's not going to let us stay the same. He is going to keep on working in us, and it may take time, as it did with Paul and with Barnabas. It's interesting to me, as we're going to see this morning, and we talked about this last week, uh, we're talking about Paul's companions, that this new young man, teenager perhaps, that replaces John Mark is so different from Paul in character, isn't he? When we read the rest of the New Testament, I think almost all Bible commentators and scholars would say that Timothy in his personality was meek, was perhaps timid, was reserved, was shy, and was probably reluctant to step forth boldly and do the ministry that God had called him to. Almost all Bible scholars would say that because there are quite a few times when Paul himself encourages Timothy. Timothy, don't be afraid. Don't let anybody despise your youth. I, I think Timothy must have dealt with a lot of um, uncertainty is not exactly the right word. Maybe self-doubt or maybe may, uh, a lack of confidence. Maybe that's the best way to phrase it, right? And yet when we look at the whole picture of the New Testament, we find that Timothy became a great man of God. Never like Paul, never boom out there in the front, but Timothy at one point was pastor of the church in Corinth. Timothy at one point pastored the church in Ephesus, the great church of Ephesus. And so I want to encourage you this morning, if you find yourself uh, not like others that are all out there and that are bold and that are always talking and, and you, you feel like, I'm not sure about myself, I, and you lack confidence, God can take you where you are and he can move you into his purposes and his plans. Just keep on walking with God. Amen? <coughs> Now that's kind of an intro. We, we talked a little bit about this last time, but there's more <coughs> as well. And so we see that out of this inauspicious beginning, uh, good things happen, uh, although they split. And so as we see, we looked at the map last time very... It's on, okay. Oh, there we go. Whoop. Okay, so they split. Uh, it's out of Antioch again. The red will be Paul's trip as he takes Silas with him, and we've heard about Silas before, haven't we? Silas was a leader in the Jerusalem church. Uh, Silas is uh, Jewish, but has Roman citizenship. That's really important, as we're going to see on this trip, because they're really going to get into Greek and Roman territory with this trip. They're going to go all the way over here. Uh, we'll get this far today. We're gonna, we'll move quickly. Uh, remind you again, oh, look. To Antioch. Remember we talked about this when we were talking about geography way back when? This is the Syrian Antioch. This is the great missionary church. 
this one right there. And then this is called Pisidian Antioch, another church bustle by the same name. So Paul and Silas take off that way. Remember what they're going to do? They're going to visit the churches that they established in the first missionary journey. So they take off that way because, why? Barnabas took John Mark and went back towards Cyprus. So both of these men are going to head through their home territory. Does that make sense as we look at the two? Now where did Barnabas and John Mark go after Cyprus? We don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us. But we know they at least that they went there first. And so the devil meant it for, bad, for evil and for bad. God meant it for good. Out of it he brought two missionary teams instead of one. Um, out of it he uh, brought a new disciple out of it. He rehabilitated John Mark. And so God brought good out of it. I promise you, brothers and sisters, I promise you, whatever strife you are going through this morning, whatever hardship you are going through this morning, if you will stay committed to God, hold on to him, he will bring good out of it. But you got to hold on to God. You got to hold on to God. If you let go, you're lost. And I'm lost too. Um, Hold on to God. He'll get it. He'll get you through. May not be easy. It may be really painful, but he will get you through. So you keep on holding on to God, to God, and he will bring good out of it. And so we see the two as they split this way. And <coughs> we've been talking about the new companions that uh, that Paul has as he goes along. So we talked about Silas, what a great companion he was, a co-worker for Paul. And we talked about what his gifts were. Remember what he was? The Bible says that Silas was a... Do you remember what he was? A prophet. That's right, he was a prophet. And so he brings very special gifts and skills to the team as a prophet. Barnabas spoke prophetic words, but Barnabas's his primary gift was the gift of encouragement in a, in a different way. And so Silas is a prophet, so they take off and they get as far. So we leave Barnabas and John Mark. Now we're not really going to see or hear from them again. They take off through there. Tarsus is right here, and that's what, that was Saul's home area. This is Barnabas' home area, so it makes sense. But it's interesting because we're going to see the work of the Holy Spirit here. Because he gets as far as Derby and Lystra, who does he meet in Lystra that's going to become part of his evangelis evangelistic band? A young disciple named... Who? Last week we talked about him. Young... <laughs> young... Timothy, thank you for the two people that remembered it from last week. Okay, so he meets a young uh, disciple in Lystra. Okay, so look with me at that. If there had not, if God had not worked in this disagreement that the enemy brought, very probably Paul and Barnabas would have again gone to Cyprus and back that way. But because there was a split, Paul takes off this way and instead arrives first at the beginning of his trip in this area of Lystra, and that's where he meets Timothy. And God has big plans for Timothy. This is in Acts, uh, if you want to look at, if you have your Bibles, end of Acts chapter 15, beginning of Acts 16. Okay, so the, the Paul takes Silas, that's, that's end of chapter 15, and then we meet, uh, then, uh, uh, we meet Timothy in the beginning chapters of Acts chapter uh, of 16, Acts 16. God has a plan. You and I, we get into tough times and things happen and we think, oh, we throw up our hands and we say, well, forget it, that's it, that's over. God is still at work. God is still at work. And as they go backwards instead of the way they went the last time, they meet Timothy, and Timothy is brought into the evangelism team, the missionary team. Timothy's a young guy. We talked about this last time, so I don't want to take a long time with that. But just by way of reminder, um, here's Silas. Then we meet Timothy, who takes the place of John Mark as the assistant or the helper. Um, everybody... When you're starting out in something like that, a helper is needed, an assistant is needed. Later on, Timothy is going to be left behind with Silas at Philippi and Thessalonica as well. You can read about it in the Bible. Um, you can read about it in the letter to the Thessalonians and in other letters as well. Later on, we're going to see that Timothy already uh, begins to move into a ministry that's greater than carrying bags, Get, arranging the tickets and things like that. 
But what we know is this, Timothy must have been faithful in what he was doing, just in the little things, and then he moved into bigger things. A lot of us are not content with the inglorious work that is needed around the church at times or in the family of God. We want the big positions. We want the, uh, we want the, uh, the seen positions, the glory positions, the honor positions. But God seldom starts people out there because people have to prove themselves. And so Timothy starts out, he's just an assistant. And we don't read a lot about him in the beginning. We talked about his godly influence, that his mother, his grandmother became a Christian first, then his mother, their influence. They saw the power of God and they saw the price of following God because Lystra was where Paul was stoned and left for dead by the mob, right? And I think that is, uh, how, how can I say it? I think, brothers and sisters, until you and I understand and learn the cost, the price of truly following God, truly being a disciple of God, um, our commitment is probably quite shallow. Oh yeah, the blessings of God. Oh yeah, oh yes Lord, bless me, bless me, bless me. And God does bless us. But there is something beyond blessing. And to walk with God, if you're a young Christian today, I'll go ahead and tell you right now, there will be times it's going to cost you something. There will be times when it's not so easy. There will be times when it's not so pleasant. But it's worth it. It's always worth it. Because with the price, there always comes the power of God and the presence of God wherever you are, whatever is going on. God is there. He is with you. <coughs> I look also at Lois and Eunice, the mother and the grandmother of this young Timothy, and I admire them so much, and I had not thought about it so much before, but Timothy was really young at this point. He may have been a teenager. And Lois and Eunice knew that this was going to be a dangerous journey. Timothy, obviously, is a young man with a lot of potential, a lot of potential, a lot of promise, a lot of talents, and a lot of gifts. But his mother is willing to release him into the ministry and into the care of Paul to face certain hardship. Parents, I want to challenge you this morning. You're sitting here, those of you with children, you've committed and you're following the Lord. But my challenge to you this morning is this. The children that you have, or those of you that are going to have children, I'm looking in the back at Jocelyn and Ying, are you willing you see, we make the commitment, yes, I'm going to follow God. But a lot of times we want something different for our children, don't we? We know that it's not always easy. We know that it's a little bit hard. And, and we want our children to choose a, a uh, more profitable way. I want my child to be, no, I don't want them to be pastors. No, I don't want them to be missionaries. I want them to be doctors or lawyers or, or, or something like that. There's no... There's nothing better than to follow what God has called you to do, whether it is you or your child, always. And God may call your children to be doctors or lawyers or whatever, or whoever. But the most important thing is that you release them into the care and the plan of God, and God will bring good out of their lives. I just want to encourage you with that this morning, um, if that's something that you're struggling with. Lois and Eunice, the mother and the grandmother, what, what a godly example for those of us who are parents. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then we talked about the other influence um, on the life of Timothy, and that was Paul himself, who called Timothy my son in the faith. And <laughs> that was an encouragement. Those of us, and now I include myself, because as you, as you know, as I've said, I'll never have flesh and blood children, but I'm so encouraged by the Apostle Paul, who had plenty of, of spiritual children. And I encourage you this morning, if you are unlikely ever to have flesh and blood children from your own body, you can nevertheless know the great joy of having spiritual children in the Lord. 
pray for them, bring them up, share your lives with them, and God will bless you and honor you and bless that spiritual child as well. Amen. Amen. <coughs> So, uh, now let's move to something new. Let's go, let's go forward a little bit and look with me at verses 3 and 4 and then we're going to move on. And I don't know if you've noticed this before and I don't know if this bothers you. Maybe you haven't noticed or maybe you noticed and it bothers you. So Paul wants to take him on the trip and it says, In deference to the Jews in the area, he, Paul, arranged for Tim Timothy to be circumcised before they left for everyone knew that his father was a Greek. Hang on here, just a minute. Doesn't this seem incredibly hypocritical? Remember, chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas fought for days. Paul and Barnabas went all the way to Jerusalem to fight those people that said, to be saved, you must be circumcised. To be saved, you must keep all of the Old Testament law. And Paul and Barnabas exactly fought this thing. In fact, one of the things they're doing on this trip is they're going to all the churches and they're telling them, you do not have to be to be saved, but just don't, don't, uh, don't eat blood and uh, uh, don't be sexually immoral and, and don't, you know, with idols and all of these things. So that's part of the message. So what's going on here? Is Paul being a hypocrite? What's going on? <coughs> And this may not have bothered you before. It bothered me um, because I'm thinking, hey, Paul, wait a minute. What I want to encourage you in is this. Whenever you don't understand something, always kind of take, back, take a minute, go back and look at it. Everyone knew that his father was a Greek. So his mother was Jewish. His father is Greek. And what we understand from this is that his father was not a believer. Now, at this point, as far as we know, his father has passed away. But his father was Greek and not a believer. Therefore, he did not allow his son Timothy to um, follow the, the laws of Judaism because that's what that was their background. And so Timothy is not circumcised. <coughs> and here they're going to go on this trip. Why does Paul do this now? Because, remember Paul's plan. Paul's plan always when he went to, into new cities, where did he go first? What area? Where would he go? He would go to synagogues first, right? He would go into synagogues. If Timothy was not circumcised and he, was, he would be considered Greek because his father was Greek, although his mother was Jewish, Timothy would not be allowed to go in to the synagogue with Paul. And so this step, if this step were not taken, it would be a hindrance to the gospel. And I want to encourage you this morning, because you look at this and probably you think, this has nothing to do with me. Why are you making this point this morning? Let's get on to the things that are more relevant to us, Pastor Jennifer. I think it is relevant to us, because I think the challenge here is this. What is there in your life and in my life that really is non-essential but we are holding on to it, and it can become a stumbling block to sharing Jesus with others. Something in our lives, something we're holding on to. And I am so challenged by this. Paul is willing to do for love of people what he was not willing to do to follow the law, but he was willing to for love. And so my challenge and our challenge is this. Are there things in your life that you're holding on to that are causing a stumbling block, that are keeping other people from seeing Jesus in you, or that are keeping other people from hearing you when you talk about Jesus. All of us have it. Are we willing to give those things up and let those things go so that we can share Jesus with people? I hope we are. Paul was willing to, and Timothy was willing to. And the point was this. I will have no stumbling block in my life that will keep people from Jesus. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And I think if we come before God and let the Holy Spirit examine our hearts and our lives, I think all of us would find areas, we would see things that we think, but this is mine, it's my right, I can do it. That if we would loosen our hands, the Holy Spirit would remove some of these things from our lives. And our witness and our life and our testimony for God would be much clearer and much more powerful to those around us. I, I really believe that. But that's between you and God. That's not for anybody to go look at your life and say, oh, well, you should stop doing that. You must whatever. That's between you and God. But you ask God about it and present your life before Him and see what He says. 
<coughs> so Timothy agrees and off they go. So he's circumcised and then they went from town to town instructing the believers and the churches because they were doing this, verse 5, uh, summary verse again, so the churches were strengthened in their faith and grew larger every day. Look with me very quickly at verse 5. Verse 5 is the picture, a very simple picture of a healthy church. Does that mean, oh, we're counting numbers? No, nope, that's not what it means because you and I both know there can be very large churches that are all messed up and have all sorts of problems and very shallow. We all know that, at least those of us who are from the U.S., right, Sister Julie? That's right. Okay. I don't know about other places, but I can say that. Um, right, Brother Keith? That's right. Um, all of us can. So the point is not we count numbers and because we're a big church, we're healthy. That's not the point. But the point is this. When a church is strengthened in faith, that means we are healthy Christians in a church. It's a healthy church atmosphere. A natural product of a healthy, vibrant church is that it will grow. It will grow. Spiritual growth and spiritual health bring, will bring other growth as well. Is that true of Lighthouse? I feel we've gotten a little bit stagnant. Do you feel that? I do. I do. And so one of the things we're doing as this afternoon we're going to meet together for seeking His face is to come before the Lord again and allow Him to renew us and to refresh us and to work in our hearts and work in our lives. Um, we must never rely on this is what we were. Oh, we were this. God has something new for us every day, every week, every year. We want to grow in Him and go on in Him. Amen? Amen. So, <coughs> they continue on their journey. They're now three strong. We have Paul, we have Silas, his companion and co-worker, we have Timothy, the helper. They're three strong. They're fulfilling the work that God has given them to do. And they've gone through the area and they've kind of done what God set them to do when they first set out. So what are they going to do now? They've sort of done the work. Shall they return to Antioch again and give the report? Okay, we visited the churches, we strengthened them, we gave the message. Woohoo! Everybody's going well. Shall they do that or shall they keep on going? As we're going to see, they keep on going. And I want to encourage you this morning because as they set out, God did not tell them everything, did He? God didn't show them everything. Paul said when he set out, let's go back and visit the churches. They've done that. Let's go see how they're doing. They've done that. Let's strengthen them and preach and encourage and do that. They did all of that. But God has more for them to do. They were faithful in what God had given them to do, and then God opened more doors for ministry. Brothers and sisters, here is a good principle for you as, you, as God calls you to serve Him and work for Him. Be faithful in what He has called you to do, and be ready when God opens other doors of ministry. He doesn't tell us everything at the beginning. You know, people that come to me... Uh, Years ago, when I, as I was preparing to come to China, many years ago, before some of you were born, before Chaco and Cherry were born, I, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure, um, uh, somebody came to me. God had called me to, to, to China, and I went to, to northern China. And so, uh, another Christian who was very different from me came to me and said, well, what is your five-year plan? <laughs> And I, I looked at him and I thought, well, I have a one-year plan. I'm, I'm going to go to China and try to survive for one year in, nor in northern China in the middle of winter without a lot of heat. Um, and it was tough. And I survived, but it was tough. Um, and every once in a while, depending on our personality and character, God will give us the big picture. But I have found that God seldom does that. He really does. He may give us glimpses. He may give us bits and pieces. But God usually gives us enough to go on, and we go, and then God gives us more. Why? Because He doesn't want us to depend on our own effort, and He wants us to walk in faith. Yeah? Remember what God said to Abraham? Abraham, leave this place and go. Okay, where, God? To the place that I will show you. <clears throat> if you and I had a ra road map for everything, we wouldn't need faith, and we wouldn't always need God, right? 
Some of us are so, are such get in there and do it people. We just do it on our own. God wants us to walk in faith and to walk with him and depend on him. And so he gives us enough to go on. And then as we wait on him, as we obey and then wait, then God opens other doors. I hope that encourages you this morning. So they have fulfilled what they set out to do. And now God has more for them to do. He doesn't always show the whole picture. So look with me. Uh, we're going to read these verses very quickly. And we're going to pick up another companion. Okay. And then we're going to come back. So <coughs> they travel through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia. By the way, when we see province of Asia, how many of you think, oh yeah, that's us? No. When it says Asia in the Bible, it means Asia Minor, and it actually refers to parts of Turkey, what is Turkey today. So when you see that in the Bible, think modern day Turkey. Okay? So that's what that is. And so, the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Aha, very important, at that time. Verse 7, then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus, still the Holy Spirit, um, did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. 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 Sorry. Okay. Verse 9 and 10. Now, li listen very carefully because we're going to pick up another companion. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. Aha! Okay. What verse do we look at right now? They've picked up a new companion. In which verse? Those of you who have a, an English writing or literature background. Verse 10. What happens in verse 10? Uh, to make it easy for you, I've put it in bold. <laughs> okay. Look at verse 10. So we decided, and us. What happens and what does that mean? Do we see we and us before this point? No. In the book of Acts, all the way up to Acts chapter 16, verse 9, everything is they, 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 they. Verse 10, it changes to we and to us. What does that mean? Somebody has joined them. What does it mean? It means the writer has joined them, right? The biographer has joined them. The one who was writing the book of Acts has joined them. Who is it? Luke. Well, how do you know it's Luke? Because we talked about it, right? Because it's, <laughs> it's here. You say, smarty pants. <laughs> smarty pants. Because you wrote it, Pastor Jennifer. That's right. Do you know that, the uh, uh, that Luke, as I recall, is not even mentioned in the book of Acts, but he's mentioned in other areas. And his name is only mentioned, I think, three times in the whole New Testament. But <clears throat> all church historians all agree that Luke wrote, uh, it was inspired by God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible and of the New Testament. Who wrote it down was Luke here in the book of Acts and also the gospel of, ding, ding, ding. There you go. That was a hard one, wasn't it? Okay. The gospel of Luke. So in Acts 16 verse 10, somebody joins and his name is Luke and he joins them in Troas. Ah, now we're going to look at this. In just a minute, we'll look at how the Holy Spirit is leading. It's such a beautiful picture of, of God orchestrating the events to, to that moment, to that place in Troas. But Luke joins at this point. We don't know a lot about him. Uh, some people believe that he, his original home was Antioch, the big, church, the, the big uh, uh, missionary church of Antioch. Some people believe that he was from Philippi. And some of you say, what? from Philippi because, uh, the, because of the way he writes about Philippi and also because Philippi had a great school of medicine and Luke is a doctor. So some people think, well, he came from Philippi. We don't know. We'll find out in heaven, okay? So we don't know for sure, but we know that he's a doctor. We won't, I, seriously, we won't know until heaven unless you have some sort of revelation. You can let me, you can, you can come talk to me about it. Um, <laughs> so I'm being careful, I just want to be careful about that. So Luke joins them, Luke the biographer, and uh, he joins them at this point. He is Greek. He is extremely well educated. In fact, of all of the writers of the New Testament, probably Luke is more educated and has better Greek than 
any of them, better than Paul even, and Paul was very well educated. He is detailed, he's a good historian, he's factual, and he's a medical doctor. And the Holy Spirit adds him to this group at this point, and from this point onward, Luke is a companion of Paul's in most of his trips. Later on, he's a companion when Paul is imprisoned, and at the end of his life, Luke is beside Paul as he faces death. What a great addition. What a great addition at this point. We need, all of us, all of us, we need people in our lives who are faithful through thick and thin. We really do. And we need to be people who are faithful through thick and thin with friends as well. We all need that. And we all need to be that. And so Luke joins at this point onward. And some of us wonder, okay, well, Luke joins now. What's the big deal about that? I think one of the reasons Luke became part of this trip, part of this, this band, is because Paul was going to have medical issues. Paul was stoned and left for dead. Don't you think that did something to his body? Now, we know God raised him up. Later on, he talks about problems with his eyes. Later on, Paul talks about, I came to you, I was so weak, I was so whatever. Paul needed the help of a doctor. And you know what? Brothers and sisters, sometimes God brings people to us that just help in physical areas, right? He, it, don't, don't, don't over-spiritualize everything. You know, sometimes we think, oh, pray for you. You know, and that's good. I, I, I'm, I'm not mocking prayer. I'm not mocking prayer. Oh, how we need prayer. And listen, if you say, I'll pray for you, pray for them. Don't just say it. Do it. Do it. I mean it. I mean it. But do you know, sometimes the help that we give others, it's practical help. We need practical help. And so Luke comes along. <coughs> Luke will become the only non-Jewish writer of the New Testament. The only non-Jewish writer. Not only that, Luke will write more of the New Testament than Paul himself. Did you know that? We've always thought, oh, Paul's the one that writes most of the New Testament. If you look at how much is written, Luke writes more than Paul does. And God brings him into the picture at this point. Now, there's one more companion as we come in the last few minutes this morning. There's, there's one more companion that I want us to look at. And this is the unseen companion, but he's not the silent companion. And he's the most important companion of this trip. Let's go back. We read through it quickly. They're traveling through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because who? The Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Later on they will. They come to verse 7, so we come to verse 7, they go up, they try to go into Bithynia, but again the Spirit of Jesus, that's the Holy Spirit. That's why all brothers and sisters, you don't have to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. Some people think, ooh, Holy Spirit, ooh. Spirit of Jesus, Spirit of Jesus. You afraid of Jesus? I hope not. Holy Spirit. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. Why is that important? Because Luke's going to be in Troas, right? Luke's going to be at Troas. Let's go a little bit further. <clears throat> and then that night, so they make it to Troas. What are we going to do? Holy Spirit says, no, nope, not here. They've gone south. They go up north. Holy Spirit says, no, not here either. They only have, they have two options then. Go back. They don't think they should. They only have one option is to keep on going westward to go straight. So they make it to Troas and, they, and they're there. They wait there. And that night, Paul has a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. Who is the unseen but not silent partner in this missionary band? Who is it? It's the Holy Spirit. Most important one. Most important one. Cannot be forgotten. Cannot be left out. 
he's the boss. You say, well, you should have said he's the boss. No, I didn't want to say he's the boss, although he is the boss, because we're talking about companions. And remember what Jesus said to his disciples and what he says to you and to me? He says, I'm going away, but I'm not leaving you. I'm going to send another one just like me. Remember what Jesus said when he sent his disciples out and we are his disciples? Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Baptize them. Do this and this. What does he say at the end of that? And I am with you always, always, always. He is with us always. He's with us always. And so here comes this vision. And some of us might say, oh, how do you know it's God? The devil can send dreams too and visions too. Do you know what? When we walk with God and our hearts are set on Him and we want God and His ways, I don't worry too much about the voice of the devil and the direction of the devil. You know that? Now if you're messing in stuff and you're doing this and you're doing that and you're doing your own thing, then you need to be more careful. But if your heart is set on God and you say, God, I want, I want you, God guide me and lead me, I think you don't have to worry so much about the devil getting in there and throwing you a hole, oh, do this and do that. Follow God. You can trust God. You know his voice. And so Paul has the dream. And what happens? Verse 10, obviously, uh, sorry, the vision. He woke up and obviously he told his companions, right? I had a vision. And in the vision was a man from Macedonia. And he was pleading and he was saying, come over here and help us. Now see, because it is something supernatural, he doesn't just say, boom, I'm doing it by myself. He presents it to other Christians, other mature Christians, right? And what does it say? We concluded, this is God. This is God. When things like this happen, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you this morning, <coughs> don't automatically say, oh, oh, it's the devil. Don't automatically say, oh, it's God. If you're unsure, come to other mature Christians, not carnal worldly Christians, but people who love God and are walking with God and who can give good insight. So here's this group and they said, they conclude, this is God. And before we say, oh, poo, 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 I don't know about that. Remember what Peter said in Acts 2, in the last days God said, this was the day of Pentecost. I want to encourage you this morning and we're going to end with some of these things, the work of the Holy Spirit this morning. God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will what? Prophesy. That is supernatural. That is when you say, who supernatural. No, beyond natural. Just say that. If supernatural scares you, just say beyond natural. Okay? Your young men will see visions. Oh, that means Paul was still a young man, right? He had a vision. Your old men will dream dreams. Uh-oh. You've been dreaming dreams? <laughs> okay. In those days I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike. Brothers and sisters, I want to highlight and I don't I, I want to, to to encourage you not to be afraid of the beyond natural leading and voice of the Holy Spirit. I think we can go in one of two directions. We can either get way out there and just be wild and crazy and everything, oh, it's, it's a sign, oh, it's this, it's that, that. Don't, don't get out there. But may I say something to you? I don't think Lighthouse is very much in danger of going that direction. I really don't. By the same token, let us not go so far in the other direction that we give no place and no regard to the supernatural voice of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. He, he helps us beyond the natural. And you and I need help beyond the natural. We are in situations. Does God give wisdom? Yes. Do we have the Bible? Yes, we have the Bible. But you tell me, but chapter and verse in the Bible, when you need to decide where your kid's going to go to school, you tell me what chapter and verse in the Bible is going to tell you how to make that decision. You have to find a new job. You have to do this or you do that. You tell me chapter and verse in the Bible where you can read what new job you're supposed to do. It's not there. Are there principles in the Bible? Yes. And get those principles. Obey what you read in the Bible. But once you've done that, beyond that, there is the supernatural guidance of the Holy Spirit. It's part of His work. Don't be afraid of it. Don't go saying, Oh, God, I want a dream. Oh, I want to be a vision. I want a vision. But instead be willing to say, God, I am open to you 
to speak to me and lead me and guide me any way you want to, whatever that is, don't despise. In 1 Thessalonians 5, I think it's verse 12, Paul writes the Thessalonians. That's one of the churches that he establishes. Do you know what he says? He says to Christians, spirit-filled Christians, he says, don't despise prophecies. He tells Christians that. And I believe sometimes at Lighthouse, we are in danger of dishonoring the voice and the work and the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He is supernatural because He's God. He's God. And there are situations where you think, I've got all the facts, but you don't. There's more. There are situations where you think, I know everything there is to know. What, what are you going to do when you try to decide some things? You talk with friends. You, you Google all the information you can Google. And then you say, oh, I'm going to go with my gut. Really? You're going to go with your gut? I'd rather go with the Holy Spirit. Right? Seriously. I, I re this, this was the, the burden on my heart for, for this message this morning as we come to this. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. So in that picture we saw, <coughs> the Holy Spirit said supernaturally how we don't know. Maybe he spoke through Silas because Silas was a prophet. We don't know, right? But he spoke and they understood. The Holy Spirit says, no. And then the Holy Spirit says, go. Ah, oh, I wish I, our time is, we have, I'm going to go just a little bit further, but I, I, our time is running out. Some of you know, but not all of you do, that when my mother, Mary, uh, was a young girl, when she was 14 years old, she was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and God gave her, when he baptized her in the Holy Spirit, he gave her a vision. And she spoke in other tongues. And the vision he gave her was of a man dressed in traditional Chinese clothes. Chinese clothes. Chinese clothes. And he was speaking a phrase over and over and over again. But mom didn't speak Chinese and she didn't, under, she didn't know what it was. But what she knew, she concluded that God was calling her to preach the good news to the Chinese at 14 years old. Years later, she and dad married. God had called dad in another way to preach. They couldn't go to China because that was in the early 50s. Mm. <laughs> they weren't. And so, they, and so God led them to Singapore and they were on a, a boat, a steamer going to Singapore and there, were, there was a, a Chinese couple on the boat and mother was a young woman at this time in her 20s and she remembered the phrase that the man dressed in Chinese clothes had said to her in the vision when she was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now pardon me because my, my, it's not that great, but those of you who speak will recognize this. She remembered the phrase, and so she went up to the Chinese couple. She said, may I ask you something? And they said, yes. And she said, here's this phrase in Chinese. Can you tell me what it means? And she spoke the phrase, and the phrase was, Cheng ne guo lai. What does that mean? What does that mean? Those of you that speak Cantonese, please come here. Please come here. And that man spoke that over and over and over again, that Chinese man dressed in Chinese robes. And the man looked at her and he said, you know, mom has a language gift. The mom, man said, how do you know that? And mom said, never mind. But she went back to her cabin and fell on her knees and thanked the Lord for his faithfulness. It wasn't until later that she found out, oh, there's Cantonese, there's Mandarin, there's Hokkien, there's Teochew, there's Hakka, there's this and there's that. But what she had heard it in was Cantonese, and that was the language of the Chinese people of the church in Singapore. God is a supernatural God, and He leads in supernatural ways to fulfill His plan in our lives. A little bit later, I'm going to ask for your patience, and then we're going to, we're going to close. I'm going to show you just two or three more things. A little bit later, same missionary journey, they're in Corinth, and Paul, the Lord, speaks to him in a vision. And the Lord says, don't be afraid, speak out, don't be silent, for I'm with you, and no one will attack and harm you. So we see the Holy Spirit say, no, we see the Holy Spirit say, go, and we see the Holy Spirit say, jiao, <laughs> okay, that means add oil, that means encouragement, right? So, as we close, let me make it applicable for us in the 21st century. The work of the Holy Spirit in your life and my life, okay? Because I don't know if the Holy Spirit's gonna 
have some man dressed up in some clothes to you in a vision. But here's the work of the Holy Spirit. Ready? Here we go. So you're, you're driving a car. Well, that's a big miracle. Okay. You're driving a car and you're going to, let's say it's a Chinese New Year festival. And it's an area you've never been before and you don't really know which way to go. So you come into town. <coughs> the festival is up here, but you don't know exactly where it is because you've not been there before. Okay. And so you come in and you're driving along here and you come to this intersection and you turn, I'm sorry for those of us, you know, imagine the arrow that way. You turn that way, okay? And as you're driving along, can you see that little faint stick figure right there? <laughs> as you're driving along, the stick figure, the person goes, hey, wait, 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 wait. And he flags you down in the car and he says, you're new around here, aren't you? And you say, yep. He says, are you looking for that Chinese New Year festival? And you say, yeah. And he says, you're going the wrong direction. Stop. If you keep on going this way, you're going to miss it. So here's the first thing. Sometimes the guidance of the Holy Spirit is correction. Stop. Don't keep going. Don't be afraid of correction, brothers and sisters. We, we hate correction, don't we? Don't tell me whatever. But if we keep, but correction is needed because if we're going the wrong way or doing the wrong thing, it's going to cause trouble to us. And so the Holy Spirit gives guidance that is correction at times. You say, okay, you got to go back the other way. Okay, so there's the festival. You're driving along and you go back. And so then you see a man by the road and he waves you down. And he says, okay, when you get to that intersection, you're going to the Chinese New Year Festival, aren't you? And you say, yeah. And he says, okay. He says, when you get there, turn and go that way. Okay, so what is that? That is direction, direction. So sometimes it's correction, sometimes it's direction. Okay, and then you're driving along, okay, and you're going this way, the festival is still up there, and after a while, you see that little man <laughs> by the road again, and as you drive by, do you know what he says to you? Yeah, keep going. You're going the right way. Stay on the road. Just keep on going this way. It's up ahead. What is that? That's encouragement. That's encouragement. Because sometimes you and I, we think we're doing the right thing. We think we're going the right way, but we're not sure. Or maybe we're tired. Or maybe it's been a long time. We think, oh, God, this is what you told me to do. Are you sure? And then God, the Holy Spirit, brings encouragement, right? That's what the Holy Spirit did for Paul when he said, when he appeared that night and he says, Paul, don't be afraid in this city. I have many people. You keep preaching. That was in Corinth. Paul needed encouragement. And you and I need encouragement as well. The work of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for your patience. I tell you what, next time I preach, I'll end earlier. How about that? <laughs> I'll do my best, but thank you for your patience. But I want us to close in prayer this morning, and I wanted to end with something practical. And I encourage you, let's just pray. And I'd like you to ask as we close in prayer, what is the Holy Spirit saying to me? He, he may have said different things. Have you been dishonoring the voice and the direction of the Holy Spirit in your life? You, you've kind of, you've been relying on your own wisdom. It's, it, it's wisdom. I, I trust God, but God has more. Is there correction or direction or encouragement? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you this morning? Because he speaks to us. He speaks to us. Beyond the printed page, beyond the words of his word, he speaks to us. When we listen and when we give him his place, he will lead us and guide us because he loves us. He'll correct us if we need correction. He'll say, yeah, go back this way. No, nope, stop going the wrong way. He'll say, yes, keep on going. I know you're tired. I know you want to give up. Don't give up. Keep going. You're going the right way. You're doing the right thing. Lord, we come to you this morning. And we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We thank you for the correction of the Holy Spirit in our lives, for the direction of the Holy Spirit, for the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. God, we are open to you for you to speak to us in any way that you choose. We don't want to put you in a box. 
We don't want to say, no, don't speak to me that way. Speak to me this way. We say, God, you speak any way you want to. Forgive us for dishonoring and devaluing your voice to us, Holy Spirit. We do want to hear from you in whatever way you choose. Guide us, lead us, correct us, encourage us, whatever we need. We thank you, Lord, for Paul, Silas, Luke, and Timothy. And Lord, we thank you that you will lead us in the same way that you led them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.